Hello church and welcome to worship and happy Father's Day. I'm Sarah Wolfson, certified lay speaker and longtime member of this congregation and I am delighted to be your worship leader again today. I hope you enjoy our time together and maybe even learn something new. But above all, may you joyfully be strengthened by God's blessings through music, praise, and gratitude today. Well, you've heard it here first. After nearly four months of separation, I am pleased to announce that we are getting back together. I hope that you will join us next Sunday, June 28th at 9 a.m. for a lawn chair service at the Ark Park across the street from the church. Bring your mask, a bottle of water, and your lawn chair, and join us for a joyful reunion beginning at 9 a.m. next Sunday. Yahoo! Safety is important. We will practice social distancing guidelines by sitting at least six feet apart, and refreshments will not be available. But together we will enjoy the wonder of the outdoors as we worship side by side with song, scripture, and fellowship. Now, if you're feeling ill or have been ill, or if you aren't yet comfortable to resume worship in a large gathering, please know that online worship will continue well into the future and an audio recording of the service will be available as well. Did you catch the time of next Sunday's service? That's right, we will begin worship at 9 a.m. starting next week and continuing the new worship time well into the future. This small change was necessary to accommodate Pastor Donna's Sunday morning schedule and to allow plenty of time to finish her worship time with us and drive to Hesperia to lead their worship beginning at 11 o'clock. Thank you for your understanding. Please join me in opening prayer to begin our worship this day. Good morning, God. Today we gather from a distance, but we invite you to be close to our hearts. We are missing each other, and we're grateful to be resuming worship in mind, body, and spirit next week. Today we faithfully gather in virtual community to worship you, our great God, as faithful followers. Bless this time together, and may we feel your closeness today and always. In your holy name alone, amen. Oh, what a year 2020 is shaping up to be. I've discovered the Home and Garden Channel, or HGTV, during our coronation. HGTV is a channel of hope, creativity, and inspiration, featuring a variety of real estate, house hunters, home restoration, and renovation ideas. Delightful programs like Fixer to Fabulous and Bargain Mansions document the process of restoring the good bones of dilapidated or abandoned homes and do a tasteful new showcase in just an hour. My favorite show, Hometown, features an adorable young couple committed to restoring houses in their hometown of Laurel, Mississippi. Ben and Aaron combine his skilled carpentry talents with her keen eye for design and practicality to bring their vision to life as they carefully preserve the history of the structure while transforming it into a shiny, cozy, and charming home with just the right vibe of an, uh, vintage, antique, and modern convenience. With so much creativity, diversity, choice, and hope for the future, I found myself tuning in regularly to see what will be renovated or restored next. As I watched, I realized the renovation and restoration theme could fit the construction of our spiritual journey while building the future of our church. So I hammered out a theme and began constructing a message that seemed ideal for this Father's Day. But first, let's build on some simple terms to help frame today's message. To restore means to bring back, to return it to its original condition, when we restore something, we look backwards. To renovate means to update or improve. When we take the best of the past and imagine a better future, we renovate something from good to great. Of course, the Bible existed long before Bob Vila, Tim the Tool Man Taylor, and the invention of duct tape and Gorilla Glue. So what does the Bible say about building? And which biblical father fits today's theme best? Care to guess? 
In the pages of my Bible, I found many instances of people constructing large physical building projects like walls, temples, towers, and altars. Then my search took me to deeper truths. The instructions and stories in the Bible also help us build our faith, our relationships, and instructions, instructions can even build our character. My search for a biblical father ended with one of the Bible's most important dads, Joseph, Jesus' early father. You might recall that Joseph was a carpenter. His occupation fit right into my theme. But did you know that there is new evidence emerging that biblical scholars have made a translational error in describing Joseph's occupation as a carpenter? Yes, he was a skilled artisan, but he was so much more. Joseph was a tecton. Translated from the Greek word meaning craftsman or builder, historians have revealed that Joseph was actually an architect and stonemason. Hebraic scholar James W. Fleming notes that the majority of homes in Israel are built of stone and explains Jesus and Joseph would have formed and made nine out of ten projects from stone, either by chiseling or carving the stone or stacking building blocks. Does this mean that Joseph never worked with wood? Well, we can't say that for sure one way or another, but there is evidence that lumber and wood was relatively scarce in the northern region of Israel where jo Jesus grew up. So a man trying to make a living as a wood carpenter would certainly have been a challenge. Biblical references to timber, cedar, cypress, oak, cassia, sycamore, and acacia, to name a few, used to build the temples were likely imported from another region. Instead, stone was the most accessible commodity in Jesus' province, and this fact remains true today. That explains, then, the many references to stones in the Bible. The Ten Commandments chiseled on stone tablets. Jesus describing Peter as the rock. Jesus was named the cornerstone of God's household in Ephesians 2.20 the stones of Gilgal, a rocky outcropping on the hills of Golgotha. The list goes on. Can you think of any other references to stone in the Bible? So though Joseph probably uh, was skilled in woodworking, he was more likely a stonemason and architectural designer. And like a father does, Joseph probably taught Jesus those skills too. It is also probable that Joseph and Jesus were recruited to build the ancient town of Zippori, only three miles from their hometown, Nazareth. During the first century, Zippori was developing at a rapid rate under the reign of King Herod Antipas. Herod's massive beautification project in Zippori would have required the help of every kind of skilled tecton in the surrounding area and Herod probably took advantage of the enormous rock quarry nearby to build his prospering town of Zippori that was emerging as the jewel of all Galilee. It also makes sense then that Jesus built his ministry through the eyes of a craftsman. Building was a simple, teachable concept of the day, teaching behaviors and guiding by example while making God our firm foundation for living, building each other up, restoring relationships, and renewing hearts and minds. Let's pause here for a classic old hymn, hymn number 529, How Firm a Foundation. Special thanks to Jack Book Brooks for bailing me out at the last minute when my YouTube videos would not load into this format. So enjoy today's hymns featuring our music man, Jack Brooks.
begin our prayer time together today, I would like to lift those who are nearest and dearest to our hearts. Let's also remember the season of transition as we continue prayers for Pastor Julie as she sets down new roots in Ohio and for Pastor Donna as she begins her ministry with us just three weeks from today. Prayers are lifted also for those affected by COVID in some way, for the ill, the caregivers, researchers, scientists, frontline workers all around the world. Please also pray fervently for the political unrest and racial tensions minimized, uh, they be minimized and resolved in a way that only God can provide. Join me please in this morning's prayer. Gracious God, Today we give thanks for the opportunity to gather in community for online worship despite this global pandemic. We are grateful for the many joys in our lives, including friends, old and new, our health and freedom, our fathers, and the anticipation of new and creative ways to worship you. We trust too that you are already know our thoughtful concerns as well as the secrets of our hearts. We pray for the lonesome, grieving, and the heartbroken for those suffering from ailments in mind, body, and spirit, and for those seeking your help in a very special way today. We are overjoyed with those celebrating weddings, anniversaries, and birthdays. We rejoice with the arrival of new babies, new career paths and opportunities, and setting down roots in new communities. We continue to pray for the people and ministries of this congregation and other local churches. We ask also for your continued protection and guidance for our community, our country, our world, its people, and its leaders. We pray your presence and peace be with us now and in the week ahead, as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I find it very interesting that while much emphasis was placed on the opulent details of building temples, altars, and sanctuaries in the Old Testament, the New Testament makes a shift to building a kingdom. But there's never mention of building a physical church, a physical building in the New Testament. Best-selling author, pastor, and activist John Pavlots writes, The church as a physical structure was never the goal for Jesus and the early church. Jesus teaches kingdom, not building. The gospel biographies are filled with evocative, vivid parables about the kingdom of God. They were Jesus' central teaching, but this kingdom he speaks about is not where, but when. Building a kingdom becomes a state of the world when people acknowledge God, when God is honored and worshipped and respected. That is when the kingdom is most present. Throughout the Gospels, we can find Jesus teaching on the characteristics of his kingdom people as they reflect the character of God in the world. The church was never about brick and mortar. It was always greater than that. It was about a way of being in the world. That becomes the pattern throughout the New Testament. Gather, eat, share, remember, live. People are the building blocks. So how does construction relate to the church of today and tomorrow? And will we choose to restore, to look back, or renovate, to make new our church? Just like the designers of my favorite shows on HGTV, I think we take the best parts of our past and make a new creation. By now you've probably heard that the leaders of our church are participating in a discovery process called Church Unique. With the help of consultants, our team of 12 is embarking on an exciting course similar to the HGTV home redesign process. We're closely examining our existing church culture, activities, values, and beliefs. In construction terms, we already know our church has good bones. 
a firm foundation with solid teachings of United Methodist doctrine, social principles, and beliefs, as well as a legacy of successful ministries under our roof and throughout our community. The team's next step is to determine what makes our church unique from any other church. We're in the midst of discovering God's exclusive blueprint created just for us. From there, we will both restore the best of our historical past and renovate and innovate effective ministry for the future. We remain committed to honoring our cultural past and celebrating our favorite traditions as we continue to encourage spiritual growth, service, and discipleship for a strong future of kingdom building together. Well, it's time to take another pause and enjoy another classic hymn, My Hope is Built, hymn number 368. Thanks again, Jack. about the importance of restoration and renovation from a church perspective, but we haven't yet considered the most foundational piece that ultimately makes the church exist. It's each of us. We know that God has created each of us as his unique masterpiece with a special purpose to fulfill while living here on earth. And he built in us specific gifts to develop and share with others. Each of us are a valuable piece of the blueprint of the world and part of his grand design. But we have skills to discover and refine in the areas of spiritual growth, leadership, and relationship with others. He's given us tools for our toolboxes and tool purses, like the Ten Commandments for behavior, thou shalt not lie, covet, cheat, or steal, from Exodus 20. The fruit of the Spirit for heart work, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control from Galatians 5. And the greatest commands to love our neighbor with all our heart, mind, and spirit, and to love ourselves, our and to love our neighbors as ourselves in Matthew 22. I believe it is out of the consistent sharpening of these spiritual tools that we can continue to gather in community and carry out God's grace. And only by constant renovation and restoration of our hearts, minds, and spirits, we can continue to fortify a strong foundation of our church. You see, without its people, the church is just an empty building. It's people with God's help, our renovators of life, restorers of hope, renewers of faith, refreshers of spirit and reminders of personal peace and wellness. We repurpose our gifts to reveal our hearts. I'm grateful for the inspiration the HGTV shows provided for me during our three month quarantine. I enjoy the variety of shows and inspiring ideas, though I must say 
Ben cringed more than once with each new idea and the possibility of another home improvement project. And I look forward to rolling up my sleeves here at Fremont UMC and using our unique ministry tools to renovate and restore, to reclaim and build on innovative ministry here in our church and community. We do have a solid foundation and good bones with the physical building, but the true heart of church is its people, you and me. I imagine Fremont UMC as a construction site where we're transforming souls. Together, we're renovating, restoring, reclaiming, renewing, and refreshing through the mission, ministries, and fellowship of our church. It's a great time to be a part of Fremont United Methodist Church. Wouldn't you agree? Join me in our final prayer this morning. Creator Lord, our master craftsman, we pray that you will continue to shape us and make us shine and that you will form and fashion us to be the fine workmanship of Jesus for the praise of his glory. Renovate and restore our minds and hearts so that we may act and think and love like Christ. Amen. And now for the third leg of our journey, uh, as we pass the baton from one leader to another uh, between Pastor Julie and eventually Pastor Donna. God tells Elijah to call Elisha to succeed him as prophet. A read from 1 Kings 19. The Lord said to him, Go back through the desert of Damascus and anoint Hazel as king as Aram. Also anoint Jehu, Nishma's son, as king of Israel, and anoint Elisha from Abel Mohala, Snaf, Snafich's son, to succeed you as prophet. So Elijah departed from there and found Elisha, Saphet's son. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. Elisha was with the 12th yoke. Elijah met up with him and threw his coat on him. Elisha immediately left the oxen and ran to Elijah. Let me kiss my father and my mother, Elisha said. Then I will follow you. Elijah replied, Go, I'm not holding you back. Elisha turned back and followed Elijah, took the pair of oxen, and slaughtered them. Then with the equipment from the oxen, Elijah boiled the meat, gave it to the people, and they ate it. Then he got up, followed Elijah, and served him. This is week three of passing the baton in our relay race. Pastor Julie has a calling to be closer to her family in Ohio. She provided ample time for our congregation to prepare for changing pastors of passing the baton to Pastor Donna. We are running the race toward victory as a virtual church within the community of Fremont. Unexpected changes is going to become normal from here on out. With God's help, we must embrace change with flexible thinking love in our hearts for one another, and continue serving and support for others within our local and global communities. As you begin another week, take these words of a simple but powerful children's song as both a reminder and confirmation of the purpose and spirit of our community. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. Amen.